today we're here with uh, Professor Emeritus Bob Carson, uh, and he will be talking uh, about, uh, he will, he'll, he'll be giving a preview of a master class that Blue Mountain Land Trust uh, will be showing. Uh, in case you haven't done this before, uh, when you move your mouse around on the screen, on the bottom, you should see the Q&A button. Uh, press that, and then you can type your questions into there. Uh, you should also be able to comment on questions. Uh, so type your questions into there throughout the presentation uh, in, in a true classroom professor style. Uh, uh, professor Carson will be, uh, there will be a couple of points where he'll be answering some of those questions during the presentation. And also at the end, we'll, we'll get through uh, the rest or at least most of those. Uh, to the right of that, you should see the chat button. Uh, you can also uh, make comments into there if you'd like, or answer questions. Or um, if you ask a question in there, we'll probably still see it, but uh, I would prefer it on the Q&A if you use that for questions. Um, and we will be, this will be recording, uh, and we will be posting this to our YouTube soon after, uh, and it'll also be on our website, fwwm.org under the uh, virtual events, past event videos tab. Uh, so you can share this with friends and, and family and we hope you do. So uh, with that, I'll transfer this over to Professor Bob Carson. Does that look good? Gruber, thank you very much for the Introduction, uh, I'm Bob Carson, retired from Whitman College. It is exciting that the museum is reopening tomorrow. Be sure to bring your mask uh, when you come here. The Blue Mountain Land Trust is going to start a naturalist program sometime this year. This presentation today is pretty much the same as I will be giving in the first hour of that naturalist program. Uh, in places in this presentation, there are going to be suggested readings from the recently published book called The Blues, other books about this area which will be the subject of today's presentation, the blues and the nearby Columbia Plateau are where the Great River bends, focusing on Wallula Gap and many waters focusing on our valley. Several times during this pre presentation, I'm going to ask you a question and I'll pause for just a few seconds. I don't know how long, 10 seconds or so for you to consider possible answers before I continue and tell you what my answers to that question will be. There are three of us uh, who will be the main presenters in the Blue Mountain Naturalist program. The other two are Mike Demme, who has written this excellent guidebook on the birds of our area with a couple of other authors and Aim Doyle, a recent resident in our valley who is a botanist and has written a magnificent guidebook to the botany of this area. Probably many of you have heard presentations by Mike Denny and Aim Doyle through the Quest program at the community college or the Blue Mountain Land Trust. Uh, in case you don't know anything about me, I'm from the mountains back east and was a geology major at three universities, uh, finishing up with a dissertation on the glaciation of the Olympic Peninsula. I taught at North Carolina State University and the University of Oregon before coming to Whitman College, where I taught geology for the first half of 40 years and both geology and environmental studies for the second half. A lot of my research has been in southeastern Washington and northeastern Oregon, 
as well as Northwestern Wyoming and Mongolia. So regarding this naturalist program of the Blue Mountain Land Trust, what is a naturalist? I'll give some dictionary definitions, which you can read faster than I can talk. A naturalist is an expert in or student of natural history. Well, what's natural history? It's uh, the study of organisms, including animals, fungi, and plants in their natural environment. What's the natural environment? It's all living and non-living things that occur naturally. Probably your first impression of the sciences, which are important to the natural environment, would be biology, zoology, botany, and ecology. I'm going to pause for a minute while you think what other fields of study are important to being a student of natural history. Incidentally, uh, the pictures that you see today were mostly taken by me, but many are by David Frame, who studied uh, natural history and photography at Washington State University, and by Bill Rogers and Duane Scroggins, who took most of the pictures in the book, The Blues. So in addition to the biological sciences, when one studies natural history, it's important to know some pedology or soil science, some geology, including paleontology, so that we can trace the history of different organisms uh, for half a billion years or so of evolution. Meteorology, weather and climate are very important. Physical geography, which I'm gonna focus on a lot today, including landforms. And even if you were near the coast, oceanography, and maybe even astronomy, because every once in a while a meteor hits the earth and uh, starts things over again, as happened in the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. Before I talk about the relationship between our landscape and the life that's on it, I want to give you an example of scale. And I am going to use the juniper dunes, which sit just northeast of the junction of the Snake and Columbia River. And that's why the juniper dunes are there. They're not there randomly. The juniper dunes are uh, one of the two largest dune fields in the state of Washington. So for reference, and I'm gonna try to use the mouths now and then, here are the Blue Mountains down in the, uh, I guess I better not use the mouths, down in the southeastern corner. And then as we go to the Northwest, we get to the Walla Walla Valley and then the Pasco Basin. And if we go Northeast, we get to the Juniper Dunes. These dunes uh, at the largest scale are what are called an erg, which can be translated from the Arabic to sand sea. And they occupy about 30 square miles or a hundred square kilometers, if I did, did my math right. And this sand sea consists of smaller bed forms, smaller scales. So here is another picture of the erg. And within it, we can see a pattern of gigantic dunes, which are called draws, another Arabic term. And the wavelength of those is approximately one kilometer as, as one goes from Southwest to Northeast in the direction of the prevailing wind. Every kilometer or so, you get another draw. Superimposed on these draws are smaller dunes. Dunes come in many shapes, uh, but in this particular dune field, there are parabolic dunes, which are very prominent in 
the uh, upper right portion, these are curved dunes and longitudinal dunes, which are pretty much straight and oriented with respect to the prevailing winds. On top of these dunes, we have an even smaller scale, and that is, is of ripples, which uh, move very quickly with changes in wind velocity, and they are at a wavelength of approximately 10 centimeters and always reflect the most recent wind, whereas the parabolic and longitudinal dunes, which are much larger, reflect longer term uh, winds, seasonal winds. So that is my example of scale. And now are we going to look at a much, much larger scale? We'll start out with the largest landforms on Earth, which are continents and ocean basins. We can take a particular continent and divide it into physiographic provinces. These are geographic regions uh, in which topography, climate, geology, soils, and the life define the province. In some cases, physiographic provinces have very distinct borders, such as the balance between the Rocky Mountains to the west and the Great Plains to the east. Seen here from the top of the Flatirons near Boulder, Colorado. This is a map of the physiographic provinces of the United States. Uh, uh, we can see in the Pacific Northwest that one of those physiographic provinces is the Columbia Plateau bounded by the Northern Rocky Mountains to the east, the Great Basin to the south, and the Cascade Range to the west. Uh, Fenneman wrote a book called Physiographic Provinces of Western United States, an old book published in 1931. The Physiographic province called the Columbia Plateau is characterized for the most part by nearly horizontal basalt flows, whereas the geology in the North, Northern Rocky Mountains to the Northeast is much more complex, much, uh, much greater variation in landforms and in rock types. Whereas the Cascade Range to the West is characterized by a much greater variety of lavas, lots of andesite, for example, in addition to the basalt, and with a lot more relief, going as high as Mount Rainier at over 14,000 feet. Well, we can take the Columbia Plateau physiographic province and divide it in, into sections. There are five sections to the physiographic province, and we are near the boundary between two of them, with the Blue Mountains section to the southeast, characterized by lots and lots of mountains to the west of the Rocky Mountains, and they're separated by Hell's Canyon, and the Walla Walla Plateau. Although it was not entirely covered by the Missoula Flat Missoula floods from Glacial Lake Missoula in western Montana, uh, it is probably the one thing which defines the Walla Walla Plateau section more than anything else. We could divide a physiographic section into subsections. And if we were to do that with the Blue Mountains, for example, we could have the Blue Mountains uh, to the east, southeast, the Wallawa Mountains to the north of that, a relatively flat area called the Chief Joseph Upland. We could jump across the Legrand Valley to the Elkhorn Mountains. 
well, how does all this uh, physiography landforms on different scales uh, relate to the biology? So I'm now going to go from physiographic provinces and sections to bioregions and ecoregions. The, the largest unit on this scale is a bioregion. And the one that's here is Cascadia. You can see that it stretches from northern Idaho and most of Oregon through our region of the Blue Mountains and the Walla Walla section up through Western British Columbia to Southeastern Alaska. Uh, what are some of the characteristics of Cascadia, which incidentally was named Ecotopia in James Fallow's book called The Nine Nations of North America. If you have not read that old book, I recommend it. But what are some of the characteristics of Cascadia? It is a region that is defined by topographic and biological features such as mountains, volcanoes. Most of the area was glaciated. It's maritime because it's near the Pacific Ocean. And for the most part, it is forested. One of my favorite scenes is from the Pacific Ocean across forests to the third or fourth, fourth highest peak in North America, I believe, Mount St. Elias. It goes from, incidentally, it goes from Denali to Mount Logan to Orizaba in Mexico, and then to Mount St. Elias in terms of heights of mountains in North America. We can divide a bioregion into ecoregions, areas of similar vegetation, terrain, climate, and ecosystem processes. Ecoregions are parts of bioregions because they're smaller areas, they're more uniform, and there are many different levels of ecoregions. So one of the ecoregions here is the nearby Blue Mountains. Think about some characteristics of our nearby mountains. Many of, most of you have been there. It's characterized by basalt flows, like the rest of the Columbia Plateau, deep, steep canyons, a dry continental climate, a temperate coniferous forest, and scattered grasslands, as well as a lot of rock outcrops. There are, there is one level three ecoregion near us that is called the Blue Mountains. There are two level four ecoregions in a nearby Blue Mountains section. One is the northwestern flank of the Blues. It is more influenced by moisture and temperatures from the Pacific Ocean than is the other level four ecoregion, which is the Mesic Forest Zone, and it's on the crest of the blues. It's, it's different because it's colder, it's different because it gets more precipitation, and then as you go farther to the southeast into other level four ecoregions of the Blue Mountains, it gets drier and somewhat warmer. Here's a picture of the maritime influenced zone. Lots of trees growing after an old forest fire. And here is a picture of the crest of the blue, the mesic forest zone with its plateaus, ridges, and canyons. 
The blues are not all forested, but they are instead a grass tree mosaic. Here we are looking at the highest point in the blues, Oregon Butte, and we can see on the left or southwest side of the ridge that there are a lot of grasslands with some scattered trees, mostly ponderosa pine, uh, on slopes that face to the south and west, whereas on the north and east, we have all forest, and we have in addition to ponderosa pines, we have aspen, which you can see in their fall autumn colors there before they drop their leaves, as well as a lot of Engelmann spruce, true firs, and Douglas firs. When we get to the Walla Walla Plateau physiographic section, we have one level three ecoregion. Think about this area to the north and west of Walla Walla. What are its characteristics? Salt bedrock, which we've heard a lot about. A lot of surficial sediments, which are not present except on narrow floodplains in the blues. Relatively low relief compared to the blues. An arid and semi-arid continental climate. Widespread Yakima, uh, widespread Missoula floods, which are for the most part, but not entirely, uh, outlined by those patterns in the upper right portion of this map. The sediments include silt, such as the windblown silt in the Palouse Hills, sand and hill silt from the Missoula flood deposits, sand, dunes such as in uh, the Juniper Dunes, gravel deposited by the Missoula floods, and a mixture of sand, silt, and gravel deposited by rivers. This area just near us, not the entire Walla Walla Plateau, but just near us, we have six different level four ecoregions, which includes islands of windblown silt, the Umatilla Plateau down to the Southwest, which was not reached by the Missoula floods. A lot of Pleistocene lake basins due to scour by the Missoula floods. Uh, some less uplands which have been dissected by streams. The Akama folds where the basalt flows have been wrinkled by tectonics. And another section was also not reached by the Missoula floods. Uh, a portion, a, an area where the basalt flows of the, uh, the Columbia River basalts have been dissected by streams. In general, the Columbia Basin, these uh, ecotones do not have trees. Exceptions would be Western, juniper, Western junipers and the juniper dunes wilderness and cottonwoods on floodplains. So this is sort of a summary slide, and then I am going to try to answer questions in which I attempt to compare the physiography, which means a lot of landforms or landscapes, and the biologies. On the largest scale, we have the Columbia Plateau Physiographic Province, and the bioregion, which stretches all the way to Alaska. Uh, the next section down, we have the Blue Mountains and the Walla Walla Plateau. We have, however, only one ecoregion at the level three level, and many ecoregions, eight of them near Walla Walla at the level four level. So climate is a critical factor influencing landforms, soils, and biota. Uh, regarding wind, a couple of examples that are not from here are 
that Hawaii and North America in trace amounts have lots of quartz bearing dust from the Gobi of China and Mongolia. Uh, there is not any quartz in the volcanics of Hawaii. That quartz comes from afar. And particularly interesting to me is that phosphorus bearing dust from the Sahara of Africa is a key nutrient for the forests of the Amazon, which unfortunately are being diminished greatly by fire and by logging. With respect to this area, ash from Cascade volcanoes is a very important component in terms of nutrient and grain size uh, for our local soils. Uh, there is a place along the Grand Ronde River just upstream of La Grande where we find not only Mazama ash from 7,600 years ago, the eruption of Crater Lake, but also beneath it, Glacier Peak ash from 13,000 years ago. As you know, there is huge variation in our temperature here between summer and winter and also by elevation. And I have some examples of that in the upper right portion of our of the screen with lows as as great as minus 54 degrees and highs even recently into the teens. Decade by decade, as you are aware, our mean annual temperature is increasing. And when people get snow like we have had recently and with massive snowstorms from New England to Texas, it makes people think that global warming is not incurring, occurring. But if you look at temperatures month by month or year by year, we see this continuous gradual increase, uh, which has been about a degree Celsius overall worldwide and will soon be two degrees Celsius. Precipitation also varies a lot between elevation and season. Uh, there are uh, some of the numbers down below. It is said that in places in the Walla Walla Valley, the mean annual precipitation increases by one inch for every mile that you go east from Little Gap to the Blues. We really have three different climates in this area from desert at the west to uh, quite humid up in the Blue Mountains. We're not only getting a gradual increase in uh, temperature, but because warm old air holds more, more moisture and has more energy, we're probably getting an increase in flood frequency. In the Blue Mountain Naturalist Program, the, after an introduction of five or 10 hours, uh, Mike Denny and Aim Doyle and others will be dividing this area into four tapestries for want, want of a better word. So those four will be the forests of the Blue Mountains, the prairies of the Palouse Hills, the shrub steppe of Wallula Gap and nearby, and aquatic systems from streams and rivers to the many reservoirs in this area. I'm now going to focus on the many, many resources of this area. 
The picture on the right, incidentally, is of a demonstration at Granite Dam. It is fascinating that the Senator from Idaho has proposed removing the lower Snake River dams. That is, of course, highly controversial. We have to weigh the benefits of those dams, particularly electricity, versus the benefits to salmon and boating of a free flowing river. So, water is perhaps the most important resource of this area. We wouldn't have much here without water. Here in Walla Walla and nearby, we have Mill Creek, which flows into, comes out of the Blues and flows into the Walla Walla River, and then down into the Columbia River and onto the Pacific. We don't have any natural lakes in this area, but we have lots of tiny reservoirs like Bennington Lake, and giant reservoirs like the one behind McMary Dam. The water includes not only surface water, but also the rain and snow melt which feed it, and the shallow aquifer of sediments and the deep aquifer of basalt, which are recharged by rain and snow melt. We use this water principally for agriculture, but also for domestic, commercial, and industrial purposes, and for lots of recreation. There are many threats to this water, pollution, drought, floods, water rights, and channelization, such as along Mill Creek through Walla Walla. Another of our most important resources is the soils. Our forests grow magnificently in the Blue Mountains. Our grasslands are very good at producing lots of bushels of wheat per acre. But the soils can have poor fertility if they're really thin, like on the basalt in the Blue Mountains or where we've had a lot of plowing and erosion. They also have poor fertility where they are alkaline, where they have lots of calcium carbonate in them. Our soils are highly erodible by both water and wind. They have experienced loss where over-tilled, over-grazed, or clear-cut. However, in recent decades, we have done much better. We have reduced soil erosion by conservation tillage and better forest practices. Our forests are wonderful for a whole bunch of purposes. They sequester a lot of the car carbon that we put into the air by burning fossil fuels. They are phenomenal for habitat like bears and elk and many, many species of owls and hawks and other birds. And they are magnificent in terms of scenery, which I'll come back to. Uh, with asterisks, I am showing the five designated purposes for national forests. We have the Umatilla National Forest nearby with uh, its crown, the Wanaha Tucannon Wilderness Area. But forests are designated, uh, our, our national forests are designated for wood products, for watersheds, that's where the Mill Creek watershed is, for recreation, which I will come back to, for grazing, I put a question mark behind that because I'm not sure that national forests should be grazed. Uh, Overgrazing can cause problems. And mining is also known, although designated for national forests, if not done right, that can uh, lead to, for example, polluted water supplies. 
I was asked earlier about precious metals and minerals. There is essentially none in this area, none whatsoever, no gold, nothing else. But we do have an abundant supply of gravel. Sometimes I think that Washington has more gravel than any other state because of the Missoula floods and because of the alluvium along our rivers. This area has almost no fossil fuel energy except for some lower grade coal in the Eastern Blues uh, and along, along the Grand Ronde River. None of that has ever been mined. It's very low grade and it would be difficult to mine because it's sandwiched between Columbia River basalt flows. We get a huge amount of energy from McNary Dam, a very large dam, and from four dams on the Lower Snake River, each of which has the ability with high flows to generate 660 or so megawatts. There are many, many wind farms and we are getting lots of them. The small wind turbines uh, on the Blue Mount, on the uh, Horse Heaven Hills generate uh, about 660 kilowatts each. And the big wind farms to our east have two, mega, two or more megawatt wind turbines. Solar has enormous potential because we have so much sun most of the year. The only operating nuclear power plant is at Hanford. And this area actually has a lot of geothermal potential for homes and for gardens. It's, it's relatively low temperature, but it's probably not commercially feasible for generating electricity. The scenery of this area, when you consider places like Palouse Falls and all of the Blue Mountains is absolutely magnificent. In part because of our scenery and our reservoirs, the outdoor recreation opportunities of this area are huge. You can read this slide much faster than I can say it, but biking of all types is very popular. Boating of all types is very popular. There's lots of birding going on, particularly with the Blue Mountain Audubon Society. We have both cross country and downhill skiing. Uh, there are opportunities for motorized recreation, which unfortunately is very noisy and disturbs critters. Uh, there's lots of opportunity for hiking and rock climbing. Yesterday, Claire and I were hiking or snowshoeing up in Tiger Canyon and had the good fortune of seeing a ptarmigan in its winter attire, pure white. Hunting and fishing is going to be covered in the, in the Blue Mountain Naturalist series by Mike Denny. We have much wealth in the agriculture of this region. Uh, we have lots of zing, in the places that aren't good for growing wheat. Uh, there are many grains beside wheat. Walla Walla area is famous for onions and other vegetables. We have lots of fruit with the grapes going to wine. We have lots of berries. I'm going to now change gears and focus on natural hazards. I'm going to pause for a minute for you to look at these pictures of mud flows and dust storms and hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and tsunami and earthquakes from other regions and ask you to think for a few seconds about the major natural hazards of the Walla Walla region. I 
I think I have a list of about six. The bottom line is that in my opinion, we are in area with relatively few and relatively weak natural hazards compared to much of the rest of the world and much of the rest of the United States. Although we don't get hurricanes, we occasionally have hurricane force winds that can blow trees over. Tornadoes here are remotely possible. We have damaging floods. And there have been, we used to say really big ones every 30 years, but now it seems like they're every 10 years or so. But they aren't bad enough to create deaths. They cause a lot of property damage. And they mostly are due to rain on snow events in winter. The worst ever occurred in 1903 in Hepner when Willow Creek got about six inches of rain in a half an hour or something like that and was devastating to Hepner, killing about 10% of the population. But since then, we haven't had any deaths from our rain on snow events. But the Hepner flood was not rain on snow. It was during June and it was a summer flash flood which is possible for Walla Walla or anywhere along the flanks of the blues. We do, particularly during these large rainfall events, get a lot of landslides and mud flows, uh, and we get a lot of gullying and a lot of sediment washed into the streams. The places that are most susceptible to mass wasting are where we have had logging roads built on steep slopes and plowing, which turns a lot of the sill to the edge, a lot of the silt to the edge of a field. We probably don't really have to worry very much about earthquakes. Nobody's ever been killed by one. We've only had one of the size magnitude six, and that was way back in 1936. But occasionally people feel an earthquake here. Droughts may be increasing. The increasing temperature evaporates more water. So at the same time that climate change gives us occasional floods, and perhaps bigger snowstorms, we may be getting more common droughts. And perhaps the most dangerous natural hazard of this area is forest fires. By suppressing forest fires for a century, we've had the growth of a lot of small trees that are close to each other. And because of increasing temperatures and probably more lightning storms, we are getting more and bigger forest fires. I think our greatest hazard in this area may be population. I'll just let you read this slide. Notice that the population of Walla Walla County has gone from just over 1,000 in 1860 so let's pick a few more dates, about 18,000 in 1900, 42,000 in 1960, and over 60,000 people in Walla Walla County now. So we need to be, since we have a higher population density, we need to be more careful with those wonderful resources that are so abundant here. So I'm gonna ask some questions for you regarding the future of this area. And I'm not going to answer them. Overall, we need to reduce the problems if possible and mitigate for them. 
what should we do to reduce the hazard of forest fires? Can you reduce your transportation carbon footprint? Should we change zoning so that we can't have so many rural mansions on 20 acres that gobble up farmland and change habitat? What can farmers and ranchers do that they have not already done to reduce soil erosion? Fortunately, this picture is from Lake Erie. It's not from Bennington Lake or Lake Lewis behind McMahon Dam. But there still is a lot of litter along our highways. And unfortunately, at times in our streams and lakes. What can we do to save salmon and other species from extinction? We have spent tens of millions of dollars to address that problem. Should we attempt to eliminate unwarranted killing of top predators like wolves and coyotes? And I'm not talking about deaths of cattle on private land. I'm talking about public land. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. It's almost six o'clock. Please do not feel that you need to stick around. But if you want to, I will try to answer your questions. Again, thanks to the Fort Walla Walla Museum, and thanks for listening to my first ever Zoom presentation. <laughs> Stay safe, wear those masks, and socially distance.